uh, if a warm welcome to all our listeners and uh, our, the audience. Once again, not in physical presence, but virtually, I welcome our guest for today, uh, Mark Leonard, whom I will introduce in a moment. Uh, we are meeting here in the series uh, Out of Kreisky's Wohnzimmer, but not in Kreisky's Wohnzimmer, but in the garden room of the Kreisky Villa and the new, newly installed Ranitsky Library. Uh, as I said, our guest today is Mark Leonard. Mark Leonard is a very distinguished scholar with a, a great record in international affairs, international analysis, and he has been the, he is now the executive director and has been the founder uh, of the so-called European Council on Foreign Relations. The European Council of Foreign Relations is the most important EU internal think tank for international relations and global affairs. And in that capacity, of course, Mark Leonard has uh, wide experience, uh, deep knowledge and uh, insights, not only into European affairs, European politics, but on developments on the global level. Uh, what is most interesting that Mark has recently published a book, which is called The Age of Unpeace. I have it here with me. The Age of Unpeace, How Connectivity Causes Conflict. And that book is extremely interesting because it offers a new approach and a very different approach to our idea about the consequences of globalization and the, the, the growing interconnectedness in global affairs, not only economically and financially, but also in personal human relations and finally on the political level. Uh, Mark, welcome. Welcome to the Kreisky Forum. Welcome to talk out to Kreisky's Wohnzimmer. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And perhaps I may invite you to explain a little bit about your thinking, how you came to this new uh, approach, new insight about the consequences of, of our global development. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a huge pleasure to be with you. Um, and yeah. it's a sh only a shame that I'm not sitting with you in the Wohnzimmer. That's uh, <laughs> we regret that as well, yes. Um, but basically, the idea behind the book is that I have been forced, but I'm a sort of optimist who has great hopes for, for the world that we're in at the moment, who's been struggling with a world that seems to be making pessimism <laughs> um, more uh, appropriate as a way for understanding what has happened. And what I tried to do over the last few years is to understand a bit more about how we got to where we are at the moment and to think a bit more about the future. And I start with a very powerful, simple idea, which I was brought up with as a sort of internationalist, which is this idea that bringing people together, binding them together deeply, creating interdependence between them is a way of creating harmony and reducing conflict by making it more expensive and more, uh, uh irrational and um the core idea behind the european union is that idea that you can somehow turn enemies into friends by binding them together within the european union we started with the coal and steel community that was then expanded to a common market and then a single currency and the idea is that you sort of create a common sense of destiny amongst people whose whose futures are sort of bound together and at a global level, after 1989, we tried to do the same thing by knocking down borders and having free trade and travel and free movement of people. And, and the internet was seen as a way of actually creating a global consciousness that could help us deal with things at a planetary scale. But yeah, but it didn't quite work out that way, did it? That is exactly um, the challenge that in 2016, um, I had a kind of powerful wake up call when 52 percent of, of British people voted for Brexit um, the same year Donald Trump was elected in the US. And what I realized from that is that many people um, saw the connections that I saw as providing opportunity and security. They saw it as, as making them insecure and making them vulnerable. 
And that led me to, to start thinking again about the whole nature of, of, of globalization and the connections between us. And my book is, is came to a kind of surprising and slightly shocking um, uh, 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 discovery from my perspective, which is that the connections, the very same connections that knit the world together are also driving it apart. And I show how um, the problem is not that globalization is failing, but in fact, that is in fact, in some ways going too well because connectivity gives people a motive to conflict with each other, lots of opportunities to fight with each other and a whole new arsenal of weapons uh, which people are using to, to hurt each other in different ways. And the book is really trying to sort of understand those three kind of big ideas. Firstly, why does connectivity make people more likely to compete with each other and to conflict with each other than to cooperate? And as you say, that goes from the individual right up to the planetary scale. <laughs> Um, also how it creates lots of opportunities for people to fight each other. And then finally, about how interdependence, rather than being a barrier for conflict, has become a, a currency of power and how people are, are turning all of the different points of contact between us and, and, uh, and each other into ways of, of, uh, of exercising power and hurting each other. And I use this metaphor in the book of a loveless marriage but where the, the couple can't get a divorce. And as in a marriage, it's the very things which bring people together during the good times that become the, the, the ways that they hurt each other in the bad times. So in a marriage, you know, it's the, the holiday home, it's who gets custody of the pet, how you look after the children. Those are the ways that the couple hurt each other when things go wrong. And in globalization and geopolitics, it's all the different facets of what binds us together. So it's looking at how trade, rather than binding us together, is turning into trade wars and sanctions and financial blockades, um, infrastructure, you know, the big debates we're having around um, around 5G infrastructure and, and, and things like that, but also uh, even uh, migration, where um, we're seeing with President Lukashenko sending Im uh, immigrants across the, the border from Belarus into Poland and Lithuania as a way of kind of blackmailing them and, and hurting them. Um, and the internet, obviously, we thought that it was something that, that brought, would bring us together, but in fact is now a kind of domain for cyber war and for uh, fake news and misinformation. So increasingly, what we're seeing is that, that all of these different points of contact uh, are becoming um, uh, tools which countries are using to, to undermine one another. And that is leading people to, to rethink the whole idea of globalization, rather than it being something that makes us rich and secure and prosperous and, and the advances wonderful technologies. It is all of those things, but it's also a big source of, uh, of insecurity because other people can come into our everyday affairs and, uh, and hurt us in, in different ways. And that is creating this sort of world of insecurity, which I call the, the age of unpeace, because I, I say that on the one hand, we don't have that many great power wars with each other, uh, but at the same time, if you look at all the violence that's going on in the world with cyber attacks and sanctions and people being weaponized and uh, all of these other ways that globalization is being manipulated, it doesn't really feel like a golden age of peace. In fact, hundreds of millions of people are being hurt every year. And that, in, in a way, is the new reality. You can't have Tolstoy anymore because there's no period of peace followed by war. What you have is perpetual conflict going on. Um, yeah. And, and that is a, a kind of new reality, which we have to, to get used to and, and come up with new ways of surviving. You have now thrown a great many ideas, uh, fascinating ideas altogether. I think we have to break them down a little bit. And what, what struck me uh, as I read your book is that you try to get the balance right here yeah, between sort of the undoubted advantages of globalization that we all enjoy and that are there, yeah? I mean, uh, global interconnectivity, uh, it's unthinkable to live without it in the economy, in financial transactions, what have you. I mean, we are used to getting fruits from South America in the deepest winter. There's a whole system of global governance behind it that this can uh, work. Uh, all these things are, are evident and are positive, but at the same time, it offers, as you said, a plethora of, of uh, 
of difficulties for friction, envy, yeah, and uh, uh, changed consciousness also. And uh, in in a, in a way, we are now, I think, coming closely to the point where we rather see uh, also the dangers that are uh, sort of connected to, to the internet, to social media, to all the, the, the nasty things also that appear all of a sudden, yeah? You mentioned issues of security, yeah? Uh, all these new forms of conflict that have come up in the last couple of years. Uh, we no longer talk about war and conflict in the traditional sense, yeah? You talk about cyber war, you talk about drone attacks, you talk about uh, uh, interference and trolls uh, uh, getting getting into into your systems and, and destroying them, uh, interference in internal politics in other countries. All these are sort of the negative sides of it. And I think what you have done in that book is that you have... Uh, in a way, balance the two things quite nicely because it's not a, it's not a pessimistic book, yeah. And you offer at the at the end also a perspective of what can be done to overcome some of these negative effects. Yes, no, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I you know, if I look at my own life, um, it's been immeasurably improved by globalization. And I think very few people want to become North Korea and live in a hermit kingdom that doesn't benefit from the sort of connections that we have with one another. But at the same time, we've been so mesmerized by the benefits of it over the last few decades that I think we've often been a bit blind to some of the downsides and whether those downsides come in, in lots of different forms. There's the, the kind of inequality which is created in our societies where a lot of people feel that they've been left behind and are sort of angry about the, 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 the way that their labor markets have been affected and that their wages have been affected. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, by voting for Trump, by voting for other parties, people want to build walls to, to shut themselves off for the rest of the world because they feel so desperate and they, they can't understand what's happening. But it also, I think, as you said, creates um, an epidemic of envy because when I was growing up people used to compare themselves to their neighbors or maybe to their parents or their grandparents but people that lived around you and that you knew nowadays because of social media everyone compares themselves to these perfect images of, of the most privileged people in the world which are delivered to them through um, Instagram through Facebook through Twitter through other kinds of platforms and against that uh, backdrop your own reality can only look um, uh, like it's not good enough because uh, we can't ever live up to these idealized ideas and but that also happens at the level of governments if you look at covid for example every day in the newspapers we could see league tables of how our country was doing against other countries so it brings out these sort of competitive instincts that you get from this age of hyper comparison when everything you're doing is compared to other people but the other thing which I think you get increasingly from globalization is uh, a sense of um, a loss of control because decisions are being made which you somehow can't get a grip on. And that's one of the reasons why politics has often been about reestablishing control. It was the slogan of the Brexit campaign. It was the idea behind Trump, behind other people of, of regaining control in this world. So for those reasons, people are sort of... Um, wanting the benefits but hating a lot of the aspects that, that it brings both in terms of insecurity um uh you know physical insecurity insecurity about wages um and uh and also there's a sense in many countries that also their countries are sort of changing as well that they are becoming somehow um strangers in their own lands that's one of the phrases that you hear from from donald trump and yes. from other players so um, my book is, is, is essentially trying to understand that dark side so that we can do something about it. And I don't think the thing we can do about it should be to build walls and to cut ourselves off from the rest of the world because we would lose all of the wonderful things about globalization. But at the same time, uh, 
once you realize that there are these bad things, then you can try and work out ways of mitigating them. And that, you know, might mean a lot of it is about how we organize our own societies. So I think one of the big lessons we've learned is a move away from sort of laissez-faire economics and thinking about how you manage our domestic regulation so that people have a bit more control over their lives and our welfare state so that people are more resilient. But also increasingly um, thinking about interdependence in a slightly different way. In the past, we thought all interdependence was good. It would create <laughs> harmony between it's us. It's understanding, yes. And now I think we understand that not all relationships are the same, that if you have a very unbalanced relationship where one side needs the other side much more, that could put them in a position where they can blackmail you. So we had these debates in Europe about, you know, 15 years ago about Russian gas and, and countries being cut off by Russian gas. In a way, that was a sort of interesting metaphor for how we're thinking about all of our kind of relationships, because the, the solution to Russian gas wasn't to stop buying Russian gas but it was to create better markets so that people could buy other types of gas and stop the Russians from using it as a political tool and uh, put them in a position where you could buy gas from other places if the Russians decided to cut you off. Um, and so you can enjoy Russian gas, but you could also, um, uh, you know, use market solutions to have access to other things. And I think what we what we saw with, with COVID was an, another example of that with mask uh, diplomacy and vaccine nationalism people are kind of worried about being overly dependent on on one player and we're moving from a kind of just in time way of thinking about globalization where it's all about getting prices down as low as possible to an idea that we should think about you know just in case what happens if people <laughs> blackmail us or it could be that things go wrong just because networks get blocked out because our, our, our world is so kind of complicated um and that uh, I, you know, I think, as you say, it's a more hopeful place to think about how you can go about about organizing things so that we are less vulnerable. But the big the biggest challenge is is um, this sort of competitive spirit which has been unleashed in our societies and between countries and working out ways of managing that. And I don't think you can eliminate that. That's one of the lessons that I've learned over the last 15, 20 years that in a way that will kind of carry on, but it gets expressed in different ways. And what we need to do is to create barriers to it. And during the Cold War, the, the big kind of biggest challenge was of a nuclear holocaust and of somehow um, nuclear weapons being used and blowing up the world. So we had to come up with ways of dealing with that, arms control, ways of counting weapons, different norms for how we related to one another. It's much harder to do if everything can be a weapon because <laughs> you can, Nuclear technology is very complicated. Um, very few people can have it. The price of getting it is enormous. It's easy to count how many weapons and, and warheads there are. In You're just places. hosting the negotiations with Iran, so we know quite well what, what is at stake here. Yeah, exactly. But but it's much harder with um, if if literally everything from you know your your fridge to your computer to um, uh, the news bulletins can be turned into kind of weapons. How do you then go about regulating that? And I think that's, that's a much bigger challenge. And it's one which we're only starting to get our heads around at the moment. Yeah. But this was just as is a new experience that uh, came out as a result of the COVID crisis, that all of a sudden, sort of the international chain of deliveries of, of goods and, and so on is, is interrupted. And uh, with all the consequences that we have, that at the moment, I mean, in, in, you cannot get bicycles anymore because certain uh, ele uh, elements of, of a bicycle are no longer delivered and uh, cars are a problem and refrigerators are a problem. So this is a, a very new consequence and, and a realization also to vulnerability. But I wanted to come to another issue. You have talked a lot about the United States and Trump. And of course, the relationship between Europe and the United States, as when it comes to connectivity and so on, is the densest that you can imagine, yeah? Economically, politically, in human relations, culturally, in security aspects, and so on. There is no other relationship as close as this one, yeah? And it has come to a point that, uh, I mean, many, analysts in the United States as well as in Europe say that you have to regard uh, 
the transatlantic region uh, as a whole, really, and not only as two separate parts of it. Nevertheless, uh, we have seen, and especially during the last years, how easy it is to uh, interrupt that relationship. And all of a sudden, uh, I mean, Europe was, was branded an enemy. There was an, an enormous competition element introduced into our relationship. Uh, mutual approach, reproaches about all sorts of things. And uh, it, it showed that, uh, uh, I mean, exactly that point, that uh, the closer you get, the more vulnerable a relationship is also. The question is, what can we do now to rebuild it and to rebuild that element of trust that has been taken away during the last years? Well, I know that you, you know a, a huge amount about the transatlantic relationship, but, uh, but um, my kind of sense is that um, what you're talking about is partly a result of, um, you know, things that come and go, political uh, leaders get elected, they lose elections. So Trump had a particular set of, of, uh, of ideas, which are maybe not going to be shared by all of his successors. And we're seeing that Joe Biden uh, has got some different ideas. He's rejoined the Paris climate uh, deal and is playing quite an important role in Glasgow at the moment and various other things going on. But some of it is, is more about structural changes. And I think that the big change obviously came in uh, 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union when we went from having a completely existential link to the US centered around um, the defense of Europe, which was the central front in the Cold War in this kind of ideological battle, which uh, was sort of defining the entire world to uh, to what happened afterwards, where we were very close and still are very close allies that share a lot of interests, a lot of values. We have the same enlightenment roots as, as the United States does. Um, there are human links between our different countries. Uh, but uh, we also um, are no longer bound in the same sort of community of destiny that's happened. And then since... So you had a sort of post-Cold War era where the relationship was different. We were close allies, but we had slightly different perspectives on some of the big issues that came up, whether it was on Iraq and Afghanistan and those sorts of things. But we found a way of doing it. But we're now entering a new phase where the central front in geopolitics is no longer uh, in Europe. It's in the Indo-Pacific. And that's the number one priority for, for the US going forward is their competition with China in that region. I think we share quite a lot of, uh, of, of, uh, of views, of interests with the US when it comes to the way that we look at China. Um, we're troubled by some aspects of the Chinese political system, the way that they behave in Xinjiang and places like that. We're both um, uh, much more committed to, to liberal uh, free market economics than the Chinese that has this model of state capitalism and is using its, its kind of huge protected uh, home market as a way of undercutting uh, our companies in lots of other places around the world and changing the kind of rules of the game when it comes to lots of different sectors. But at the same time, um, you know, we and have gone from being this as Europeans have gone from being the center of geopolitics and the center of American concerns to being on the periphery. Um, so, therefore, uh, whoever's president, whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump coming back, or uh, even you know Obama's children or whatever, <laughs> their yeah. main focus is not going to be about Europe. So their main hope that they have from Europe and, and the Middle East and our neighbourhood is how to get out of it, so that they can put more resources into this competition uh, against China. So that's one thing that's happened. The second thing that's happened has been that there has been a big backlash against globalization within the US, which is leading to Americans wanting to pull back from free trade, from a lot of the links which they found with other players and to put America first um, in different ways. And 
that can be done in a very impolite way under Trump or a more polite way um, with Biden when he talks about foreign policy for the middle class. But it does mean that they're sort of thinking differently about their kind of role. But the third thing that's happened is that Americans, uh, as indeed other people have, has di have discovered that the cheapest way to exercise their power around the world is through weaponizing and, and militarizing globalization rather than sending troops to every corner of the world. And that was something which was found out by accident almost um, in the Bush administration after 9-11 when uh, uh, George Bush was trying to work out how to pressurize other countries. They developed a whole series of, of different kinds of sanctions to the ones that we'd known beforehand, which were not these kind of blockades of different countries like they used against Cuba for decades and decades, but much more finely targeted sanctions where they used the, the reach of the dollar and the global financial system as a way of, of going after terrorists initially. But that then got expanded to go after whole countries like Iran and then Russia and, and, sometimes, and, and now kind of even more widely. And that's how we found ourselves on the wrong side of these sanctions, um, you know, German companies um, being targeted because of the Nord Stream pipeline, which the American Congress doesn't like, um, or even uh, car companies being told that they were a security risk <laughs> to the United States, which was quite a shock, given that, that they were kind of allies in NATO, the Germans, to, to discover that Mercedes... This is, this is a very old bone of contention between the United States and, the, and Europe, that we find it very difficult to accept the American premise that American law is superior to everything else and gives them the authority and the right to impose their uh, legislation, their legal thinking on every situation that uh, they might be interested in. Uh, I mean, so the, 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 the mere fact that uh, they impose sanctions on European companies that are involved in Nord Stream is in effect outrageous and it's uh, contrary to any kind of international law and so but nevertheless it's a fact of life uh, uh, and an outcome of, of sheer American power yeah the I think that's right, but it doesn't have to be a fact of life. And I think that's where I was kind of leading towards what can we do about it? I mean, I, you know, I'm an Atlanticist. I'd like to carry on being close allies to the US, but sometimes the US overreaches and, and doesn't yes. really respect yeah. other people's sovereignty because they're so focused on their own, on the sovereignty of the American people. And in those circumstances, it's, it's quite important to, to push back. And in trade, we've got very good at it. You know, when the US introduces tariffs on European products, we've been quite good at saying actually that's not really acceptable and coming up with with ways of making that expensive so um the european commission has been quite good at finding particular sectors whether it's going after jack daniels or holly davidson or other places that are particularly painful for for members of congress who might shift their position as a result of the pressure which we're putting on them and i think increasingly we have to do the same when it comes to to, to sanctions as well if you introduce or threaten to introduce sanctions against Total or Airbus because they're doing uh, uh, they're investing in Iran uh, after um, the US and lots of other countries sign a nuclear deal with Iran, which is becomes part of international law. Um, we should be able to to defend our our, com our companies for for following international law, and I think that you know in those circumstances. Ultimately, we should be able to, to tell the US, if you do this to our companies, we will introduce similar measures to, to your companies. Not because we want to, we'd much rather not have to go after Exxon or go after Boeing. Um, but if you will not respect international law, if you impose your preferences on our companies, then we're gonna have to retaliate. And the hope of, is that by threatening to retaliate, we can make it it, um, so expensive that people don't do it at all and we end up with a kind of more open world but I think um, that's where we're sort of moving towards is that having a debate about European sovereignty which is thinking about these points of vulnerability um, where we can take countermeasures if necessary if people use economic coercion against us I mean they've we just talked about some examples from the US, but I think much more worrying are some of the ways that other countries could use economic coercion against us, whether it's China or Russia or other players. But just being able to do it in an undramatic, unemotional way like we do on trade, just to bring these 
these measures forward or threaten to bring them forward. So hopefully we can kind of keep markets open. We also do need to look at at managing our relationships so that they're balanced, so that you don't put yourself in a place where you get bullied. And I think, you know, with, with the US, the big imbalances are around the role of the dollar in the international system. So promoting the role of the euro as an international currency is one way of giving ourselves a bit more control over our own affairs. And the other big area where we find ourselves um, on the back foot is, is in technology and information technology, where m- most of the big companies in the world are either American or Chinese, and the choice is either going with China or in America. Um, and ultimately, what we need to do is to invest in domestic innovation so that there are the other options, because that is it's a healthy way of being. Yeah. It's a long term project. But um, I think what we need is a series of, 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 of different policies in our education policy, in our innovation policy, in our trade policy, in our competition policy, in our macroeconomic policies, which will allow Europeans to be, to be players, to be a bit more resilient in the world. And it's a generational project, but there are things we can do immediately uh, to, to, to do with that. And I, it, you know, I don't think it's about being anti-American. I think hopefully if we get this right, we can also be better partners to the US where, where our interests um, align with the US, which is in many, in many, many areas. And I think the US would be much clever, you know, strategic Americans would much rather have a grown-up relationship with the European Union that can stand on its own two feet than a, a sort of infantile, infantilized Europe that is totally yeah. dependent on the US and, and doesn't look after itself and is constantly asking America to help it out with things that we should be able to pay for ourselves. Yeah. There are two recent examples that prove your point. The one is that uh, uh, due to sort of negotiations as well as counter, counter reactionary measures, uh, the United States has shifted their position on Nord Stream. Yeah. Yes. And it's no longer, I mean, this total opposition to it. And uh, the second thing is that uh, the retaliatory measures that the European Union imposed uh, has led to the lifting of the Steve sanctions. And that's also, that's a, a very recent development, but it shows that the moment you take a stance and you, you react and answer, you can also achieve results. I was wondering, because you talked a lot about the sanctions issue, and that's something that has been troubling me for a long time, uh, that you have the feeling in international relations, the toolbox that we have for dealing with each other is getting more limited, yeah? And uh, that whenever a problem arises, you slap down sanctions, yeah? And uh, I found it very interesting that uh, in many different fora, groups have been coming up dealing again with the issue of diplomacy and what is what uh, is the issue of negotiations, yeah? And, uh, and the future of diplomacy platform in Harvard and uh, Carnegie International, I think, is dealing with that. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of thinking going on uh, how you can uh, reintroduce, in a way, uh, a special value to diplomacy and diplomatic negotiations uh, opposed to this uh, sort of very hard line uh, slapping down sanctions approach uh, in international in international affairs. Do you see that as well? So I think the the proliferation of sanctions was I I think can be attributed to a number of different uh, facts. One is um, uh, a kind of growing realization, particularly after Iraq and Afghanistan, that um, the wars are very expensive, often don't work particularly well in terms of achieving your objectives. And that has, you know, that is something where, where you get the pendulum swinging from one side to the other. You know, you had lots of wars going on after the second world war vietnam yeah. korea etc and then when the us got bogged down it then kind of retrenches and looks for other tools and i i certainly um during president obama's time there was a, a tendency to reach for sanctions and drones and other kind of uh ways of 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 wielding american power which didn't involve putting troops on the ground and i think that's only kind of growing but i think one of the reasons why it was attractive is because 
sanctions have become much more sophisticated as well. And it's where we started with a bit. Our world has become so uh, bound up um, with these complicated networks and international supply chains and other kinds of things that sanctions are, are much more effective. You know, when during the Cold War, there was almost no trade between the United States and the United uh, and, and the Soviet Union. So sanctions would not have helped at all because <laughs> you can only use sanctions where you have kind of thick amount of contact. But now um, countries have much more contact with each other. So you can hurt them much more by, by cutting it off and by manipulating it. Um, and there are new types of information that come out of the global financial system, out of the internet. So you can use intelligence to have much more targeted yeah. interventions. Yeah. So I think that that's that's one kind of element. I think what you're saying, diplomacy, in a way, is maybe uh, a slightly different phenomenon. But I think it's also a really interesting one that I think after the end of the Cold War, we assumed that diplomacy and foreign policy was going to disappear because we were ending the distinction between home and abroad and we were all being bound together into kind of into one world and um everything would become more like domestic politics because that's how you deal with these kind of big issues so in a way um having been in a period during the cold war where diplomacy was incredibly important because partly because at the back of everyone's mind is this idea that if things go wrong we can end up with a nuclear <laughs> holocaust um, it was super important to understand what other people were thinking, how they framed issues, and we taught them as really foreign. So we, we spent a lot of time trying to get into the Soviet mind and to understand what could be working uh, within the Soviet Union. Then we had this sort of period of globalization where we kind of thought we were all becoming similar and like each other. And, and we used the same uh, language and everyone spoke English and we, we had the same or sort this, of this. Um, and I think that that led to a loss of curiosity about what was going on in other places. So certainly in the West, we thought we'd won the war, the Cold War, that is, and that people were going to become like us. So, you know, when the, the European Union looked at other countries, also after the success of enlargement, the assumption was that they were going to become like us, like as enlargement did. So when we looked at other countries, we looked at where they fell short of the acquis communautaire and how they'd have to change in order to do it. And that's obviously made sense if you're looking at a country that was trying to join the EU, like Serbia or Bosnia or whatever. But but we had a similar way of looking even at big countries like China, which like didn't want to join the European Union and uh, bigger than the, the whole of the European Union anyway, for, like several times the size of the European Union. Um, and we, we didn't have the sort of curiosity that we had about other places. And I think we discovered through some of the absolute catastrophes of, of our diplomacy and our foreign policy over the last few decades, how differently people think and how they act. And in Iraq and in Afghanistan, we discovered, you know, we can invest as much energy as we wanted to, you know, but Afghanistan's not going to become like Sweden or Denmark anytime soon, no matter how much we, we kind of want. And I think hopefully that has led to a, a new humility about how much we can understand others and to start looking at foreigners as foreigners and therefore not simply as, as people who haven't quite become like us yet. <laughs> but who are on the way to becoming like us. And that now, isn't that also the experience that we are having just now at the, inside the European Union? Yeah? Well, we have, uh, we, we have assumed that the moment we are members of the European Union, we accept the Aki Communitaire, we accept uh, all the standards that are there, uh, we will become very similar and we discover that this is not the case and that there are uh, not only political things, but that there are sort of there's a rise in nationalism, there are populist movements in many European countries, that uh, this uh, thinking of we against them uh, is, 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 is there as well as a lot of competition. You have mentioned at the beginning the COVID crisis. Yeah, we have a competition between the European Union members saying we are doing better in vaccination than they and we have more vaccine than they do and, and, and so on. Uh, and and uh, it, it, it goes, in my opinion, it goes to show that uh, 
um, I mean, in, in a way, it reinforces your argument. You know, that in spite of all the the connectivity that is there, uh, these underlying, some cases, long term factors of, of of policy still play a very important role. I think that's that's very astute what you're saying. I, I think that's right. I do think there is a, a difference within the European Union, though, just because um, we have taken some uh, tools for foreign policy off the table completely, like war against one another. Yeah. I mean, bounded it in a way yes. that we haven't done between other countries. But I, it's definitely true that, and, you know, on the one hand, the EU has been an incredible factory for convergence. If you look at the standard of living between Poland and Germany now compared to 20 years ago, it's a pretty different story that you get, um, uh, or 23 years ago, 20, before 1989. Uh, it's remarkable how much convergence there has been. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. The, the differences are becoming a more and more important part of our, of our, of our politics. Um, and they're playing out in quite sort of brutal ways. And it's one of the reasons why um, people in France and Germany um, and other countries are so nervous about the rule of law, because it, you know, it, poses, it poses a sort of existential question about whether the EU actually can work as a, if we're based on mutual recognition. How much difference can we deal with? Because the idea of the EU is to allow people a lot of difference culturally in terms of the language they speak. In some ways, the EU has made it possible for countries to be even more different from each other by protecting um, champagne and parma ham and other kinds of things. It, it, it allowed countries to, 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 to grab hold of their national peculiarities and to celebrate them even more. And also because it provides a bit of a shell where as a small or medium sized country, you can still operate in a global world because you have the protection of the European Commission and of a bigger market. People try and bully you and to, to, to blackmail you. But at the same time, those differences within the EU are creating more and more tension and you are seeing nationalism rising everywhere. Um, and um, I mean, I, I think that um, uh, it both, I think, does show <laughs> That my argument's true about how connectivity creates um, uh, competition but I think the EU also shows some of the ways that you can make sure that that competition is, is largely benign and not too malign by creating boundaries to how far that competition will go and also by creating a sort of politics which helps to, 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 to bring the losers along so that they don't end up losing too badly and I think the EU is a framework where we've been doing that and the, the whole next generation Europe, the recovery plans, are real attempts to try and, and, and deal with some of those issues. But it is complicated. Yes. The, I, I've, I've uh, always felt that uh, one of the most successful programs of the European Union is the program of, of cohesion and the cohesion funds, where which exactly led to that kind of convergence, bringing poorer regions of Europe up to a certain standard and, and, and uh, making for, for, for this kind of, of, of cohesion that is necessary if you look at Europe as a whole. On the other side, uh, I mean, we are dealing with two very different notions of sovereignty and identity, I think. And uh, I, I remember that in, uh, well, first of all, the notion of sovereignty. I, I remember that in the United States, we always had a discussion about uh, about sovereignty, and for the Americans and American thinking, the idea that you share sovereignty, this European notion of, of, of sovereignty, was completely incomprehensible. They couldn't they couldn't get around that at all. Yeah. At the same time, for those new members of the European Union who have emerged out of the communist uh, uh, communist empire, yeah, so to say, uh, the notion of sovereignty and being responsible for their own affairs is a very important one. Yeah? And so is, of course, the notion also of their own national identity. And, uh, and in 1989, very shortly after 1989, 
the very the distinguished American journalist William Pfaff, I don't know if you remember him living in Paris, uh, published a book which he called Barbarian Sentiments. And there he said, uh, or he issued a kind of a warning saying that uh, so the, the communist leadership in the East of Europe has worked like a deep freeze. And now the freeze is lifted and all sorts that have been, things that have been frozen will emerge, yeah? And in a way that uh, that is quite true because uh, developments, sociological developments, philosophical developments, in developments in reasoning, and so now we think about issues that have happened in the Western part of Europe uh, have not happened to the same extent in the East. And I think the problems that we have at the moment with uh, many of these centrifugal forces in the European Union are going back to that to that very basic issue. That I there's a different notion of sovereignty and, and identity. I think that's definitely true. And I, I mean, I, you know, I can, you can sort of understand very clearly why countries that were living under the yoke of the, the communist empire um, are desperate to to regain control over their affairs. But what I think is, is quite interesting is, is how those sentiments are equally true of lots of countries that were empires rather than subject to empires. You know, if you look at the UK, that's very much what was the, the, at the heart of the Brexit campaign, you know, the idea of taking back control, that was their slogan, vote leave, take back control. If you look at France, another kind of uh, recent imperial nation you have a very strong desire to take back control, which is being manifested in support for Eric Zemmour and for the for, for Marine Le Pen in, in French politics. But equally, even Michel Barnier has reinvented himself as a as a sovereignist now that he's no longer um, working for the European Commission. Um, and, and you get kind of elements of that in every single one of our countries in Austria, the FPÖ, in Germany, the IFP. Um, uh, in Italy, the Lega and the 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 the, the, um, the Meloni's movement as well, um, and I think that in a way it shows that Europe it seems to be at a crossroads where it comes to sovereignty. Where you know, for for most of the last few decades, the problem of sovereignty was how to tame sovereignty because we'd seen the sort of catastrophic impact that untrammeled militarized sovereignty had had through all the bloodbaths of history in the 19th century, the First World War, the Second World War. Um, and the goal was to try and work out ways of, of getting the sovereignty of, of European countries um, reorganized in such a way that it wouldn't plunge the planet into that kind of morass that we had been in for the for the last uh, few decades and centuries. Um, nowadays, as power shifts from Europe to other parts of the world, the problem of sovereignty seems to be a slightly different one, which is not how to tame it, but rather how to get it. Our big fear at the moment is that the future is not going to be made in the continent of the Enlightenment that's been at the centre of the world for hundreds of years. But the future is going to be worked out in Japan, sorry, in China, in America, in other places, and that we're going to be the playthings of, of, of history rather than uh, the, in the cockpit of history. And the question now, I think, is how can a country the size of Austria or even Germany or France still have some sort of control and sovereignty in a, a much more complicated world where other powers don't want to do what we're telling them to do and in fact increasingly thinking about how they can control our affairs and the way to do that is 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 a slightly different one so it's, I think about is not so much about how much power goes from from Vienna and Berlin and Paris to Brussels, but it's more about how can we collectively win back power from Beijing, from Washington, from Facebook, from from Google, <laughs> from Huawei, and um, that I think makes me quite hopeful that it it should be possible to capture those sentiments that you're talking about 
but to somehow use them to make the case for common European action rather than for them to be uh, simply expressed out of opposition to Brussels. But the trick is for Brussels to show that it can actually be a, a, a turbocharger for people's national aspirations rather than something which, which destroys them. I think that's a, you know, a feeling which Emmanuel Macron definitely has when he talks about a Europe that protects and the idea of European sovereignty. He's trying to capture that very impulse, but not very successfully. You know, I think a lot of people worry that what he's talking about is simply making France sovereign over their affairs. <laughs> and they worry about whether he really is that interested in, in, in what Poles want for their future or, or Lithuanians or, or Austrians. Um, but that, you know, I think is going to be one of the big battlegrounds for politics over the next few years, whether we can actually um, spin the European project round so that it's less about an internally focused project where we're trying to, to tame our internal nationalisms. And it's more about thinking about the world outside and how we organise ourselves together. To, to, to have some say in a, in a very complicated world where you don't just have, you know, great powers that are behaving in more scary ways. You have these big companies which are bigger than many European countries yes. like Facebook and Huawei and, 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 and Baidu, etc. But also you have these global problems like climate change and COVID, which we can't possibly hope to deal with if we don't um, come up with, with um, solutions above the level of the nation state. Yeah. We had, uh, before Austria joined the European Union, we had a big debate in the country about exactly these issues, sovereignty and national identity. And in, in a way, the argument then prevailed that in our times, you exercise sovereignty by being there where decisions are taken that affect your country. Yeah and that you can't escape anymore. And I think I, I've, uh, I've been very much, uh, I very much regretted the British decision to leave the European Union. I was opposed to Brexit from the beginning. And I still think it's, it's very sad that Britain, Britain uh, left the European Union. Uh, but I think at the same time they are discovering now that this notion of gaining back control was an illusion, yeah, and you cannot get back control uh, in 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 the way they were talking about, or thinking about. I mean, you in in your book you mention in one instance that uh, the 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 Washington and the United States uh, you call them the gatekeepers, but then the European Union is the rule maker. They are the rule makers, the standard setters. And that, of course, is an enormous power that they have, uh, not only in economic sense, but also in, inter in obliging other countries to, oblige, to um, abide by the standards and the rules that are the, you worked out in the European Union. So there, there are many of these notions that you have about gaining control and pre-establishing sovereignty and so turn out to be illusionary. I think so. I think it, it's too early to say that that conclusion has been um, fully accepted by everyone in, in the UK yet. And I oh, think that, yes, of course not. Yes. <laughs> but, I mean, looking at the situation as it uh, develops, I think that it's pretty clear that this is happening. Yeah, I think it's an interesting experiment for, for how, um, uh, you know, how sovereignty is exercised in the 21st century. And I think that, that um, that's one of the reasons why the whole idea of Brexit is so politicised both here in the UK, um, but also in every other country, because for the British government, it's very important to show that they really have got new control and that they're able to do things which... Um, EU member states are not able to do and for the rest of the EU um, particularly leaders who believe in the European institutions who are worried about some sort of contagion effect it's been very important to show that Brexit has been uh, a disaster for, for the UK and I think that's one of the reasons why you have this very zero-sum debate at the moment and even though Brexit has happened uh, 
we're a long way from developing healthy and and I think mutually advantageous relations between London and and the rest of the EU because um, there is this battle of narratives which is which is playing out and I think it will take a while for people to realise yeah. um, exactly what 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 the significance of Brexit has been. I think there's a, a major difference in between Britain and France. You have mentioned Macron and, and Michel Barnier. Yeah, uh, the the French always try to use the European Union as a backfoil for their imperialist notions, whatever, whatever they might have. Yeah, or global notions. They know that uh, as a country alone. They are also a country of modest size, yeah, and then modest influence. But with the European Union in the background, they can do uh, can reassert themselves. But the British have been thinking sort of we are doing better alone, yeah, and and uh, we can regain our global standing easier by going it alone. And I think this is uh, there will be a rough awakening because it's not so easy in these times. Especially if you, if you look at the, the global patterns and the changing, uh, changing power centers and the shift in, in, in international affairs, especially to the, to the Pacific region and Asia. I think you're right. I think the, the, we're moving towards a world of blocks. So being yeah. outside the block is going to be much more uncomfortable in yeah. the future than it has been in, in recent times. Can I introduce one last point, which I also found we are slowly running out of time, but this is one question that has intrigued me. Uh, you talk in your book about migration uh, and migration as a factor also in, in, in this connectivity problem yeah, that, you, that you describe. And uh, you see migration quite rightly, in my opinion, not only sort of as not only the refugee crisis, yeah, but that people are migrating for a lot of different reasons, yeah. And uh, as, as somebody said, trees have roots, but people have legs and they move, yeah. And uh, and of course, through moving and through this migration that is now so, uh, I mean, it's a factor of the 21st century, yeah, that will populations are, are, are mingling and, and, and shifting. Uh, and, the, and you talk about four different categories. You talk about the, the generators, the neo-colonialists, then you talk about the go-betweens and the integrators. And I find that classification very interesting because uh, it, it goes in in my opinion, to highlight the different roles that migrant populations in another country can play. Yeah. And, uh, and that can be on the one side, bring a lot of benefit, but at the same time can also cause problems. Yes. No, so exactly. So I, basically, you know, one of the we migration has been with us for as long as humans have been with us yes. been moving on the move but the amounts of, of movement i think are now uh, at very high levels again and you know we've had periods of time where mass migrations have completely changed the map of the world not least people moving out of europe into into america and into the into uh, into a lot of the colonies um now interestingly a lot of the movements in the opposite direction <laughs> from these former colonies towards um uh, towards europe um but i i kind of show how increasingly migration and the management of our borders and of the flows of people have bec has become an important geopolitical tool and um i there are these four ways that you could think about it so i could just explain them briefly but so generators essentially countries that are trying to force people out uh, of their own land into other lands as a way of exercising political power. So a good example of that is um, Libya, for example, when Gaddafi was uh, was running Libya, he promised to, to turn Europe black by getting people to come to, to go over the borders and use that as a way of capturing uh, economic concessions 
from 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 European countries. Um, that's being used, but you know, in Syria by by the Russians often have, have, have threatened to kind of control their borders and to to, to shift people out, uh, you know, to stop people working in Russia. Uh, a second kind of group, a uh, kind of neo-colonialist. So. As I said, in, in in the 19th century and the 20th century, lots of Europeans were settled in other places and that they got a lot of economic benefits from that. The big kind of settlers now are the, uh, are, are the Chinese. There are tens of millions of, of Chinese uh, uh, people of Chinese origin around the world, particularly in Africa, where you have you know very large numbers of people who settle down and they build economic relationships, which are, which are, which benefit. Chinese companies and create a lot of, uh, of links across them. The third is about go-betweens. So countries that have sought to weaponize their place um, as, a, as a, a kind of transit country. So the best example of that was President Erdogan who basically offered, threatened to put um, uh, people from Syria into, and Afghanistan into buses and to bus them to, <laughs> to Greece and to other yeah. countries. Um, as a way of, 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 of extracting money from Europeans. But there are over 70 cases in the last few decades of, of leaders uh, doing um, that. Um, you know. and, and then the final idea is, is integrators. So people who, countries that have made uh, a, a good job of attracting talent and ideas from all over the world, but turning them into citizens within their own countries. So the US in a way is the sort of classic uh, example of that. So many people have sought a better life in America and most great American technologies and companies have actually <laughs> been created by people who were born outside of the United States of America from, you know, you know, it's impossible to imagine Hollywood or Silicon Valley or any of these things, or even American foreign policymakers with Kissinger and Brzezinski. They're all kind of uh, ideas that have been taken in from, from elsewhere. But more recently, Israel has reinvented itself as a startup nation, partly by, by bringing in talent from all over the world. Um, and even, uh, anyway, I use this slightly tongue in cheek example of, of ISIS, which was a kind of very improbable non-state that was formed for a brief period of time, uh, the so-called Islamic State, but that could not have happened without bringing people from, from other players. But I think those are all examples of countries trying to, to find ways of making the movement of people work for them. And uh, I think, you know, alongside trade and the flow of information and, uh, and data and um, uh, the flow of financial services and, and, and physical infrastructure. I think migration is both an important source of power, but is going to be an increasingly powerful battleground in the 21st century. Yeah, it's not only the mass migration, it's the mobility of the people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you, if you look what we have achieved within the European Union, that people can move freely from one country to another to work, to study, uh, that goes as well for the for the United States. I mean, the the flow of people in, in all directions is is uh, is quite massive. And if you look, you introduce the example of the United States as integrator, an integrator nation. If you look at the rapidity with which uh, immigrant uh, groups can achieve higher social standard in the United States. That's quite breathtaking. I mean, it goes very fast. Asian communities, Indian communities, and Arab communities also in the United States have achieved a higher standard of living, a higher standard of education in a very short time. And that shows that there's a lot of strengths in integrating uh, populations. Thank you, Mark. This was a great, a great conversation. We could go on talking. Uh, there's one one thing which you have not touched at all. Your your most uh, your book before that one, uh, where you talk about uh, sort of the 21st century being a European century. That would be an interesting conversation also to have. And uh, 